From 12 News, this is Newsmakers. Welcome to Newsmakers, I'm Tim White. Last month, Lifespan and Care New England announced they were merging along with a partnership with Brown University's Alpert Medical School. This week, an interview with the main stakeholders in this mega deal, but first, to get you up to speed, 12 News politics and business editor Ted Nisi sets the stage. The leaders of Lifespan, Care New England, and Brown University releasing this photo after signing an agreement to create a new academic health system in Rhode Island. The deal would bring seven hospitals under common ownership, including Rhode Island Hospital and Women and Infants, with roughly 23,000 employees and billions in annual revenue. The executives distributed a video explaining their thinking. Rhode Island is one of the only states in the country that does not have a single integrated academic health care system. Massachusetts has four or five. Rhode Island has none. Brown's involvement playing a crucial role. As the operator of Rhode Island's only medical school, the university says it will spend $125 million over the next five years to make the academic health center a success. We want to advance knowledge to treat and cure diseases so that Rhode Islanders can become even healthier. And we want to galvanize economic development through creating jobs for Rhode Islanders in the biomedical innovation sector. While previous efforts to bring together Rhode Island's biggest hospitals have floundered, the executives say they think there is more support this time. Outgoing Governor Gina Raimondo among those expressing optimism. She helped engineer the deal to avoid Care New England falling under out-of-state control. The hospital system would dominate Rhode Island health care, with roughly three out of four patients going to one of its hospitals, which could draw concern from regulators. The executives say they expect the new organization would add jobs over time, but the head of the United Nurses and Allied Professionals Union said Tuesday, while we see the potential in this proposed new entity, we remain skeptical without the assurance of a formal agreement on services and jobs. On Wednesday, Ted interviewed Brown University President Christina Paxson and the Dean of the Medical School, Jack Elias, as well as Lifespan CEO, Dr. Timothy Babineau, and the head of Care New England, Dr. James Finale. They discussed where things stand now and what this merger could mean to Rhode Islanders. I want to thank the leaders of uh, our biggest hospitals and our biggest university for being here with us today on Zoom due to the pandemic. And uh, we have a lot to talk about, so I want to dive right in with all of you. And I want to start with uh, just to go around the Zoom, as we now say. And uh, look, there are going to be viewers watching this morning who say, haven't I heard about Lifespan and Care New England merging over and over, but they never actually merge? And is this going to be the same thing? And I know all of you feel it is different this time, but I want to hear why. So briefly, in 30 seconds to get us started, and I'll, I'll kick off with you, President Paxson. Why do you think this time is different for Rhode Islanders who feel like they've seen this movie before? This time is different. And even though we're in a Zoom room, I think it's probably the first time Rhode Islanders have seen the four of us together in a room talking in a united way about why this is so exciting for Rhode Island. Okay, same question to Dr. Babino from Lifespan. Yeah, thanks, Ted. Great to be with you today. Um, I think if uh, the pandemic demonstrated one thing it's how important a stable, resilient healthcare system is for the welfare of the state. If Care New England Lifespan and the other hospitals hadn't been here at the ready, the pandemic could have ended a lot worse. I think when we work together, a couple things happened. Our patients got better care, the organizations were better served. And I just think that the circumstances and the time are different. The pandemic has taught us that bringing these two entities together in partnership with Brown is the best thing for our patients and for the state. Dr. Finale? Yeah, thanks, Ted. Um, I would say uh, uh, Tim, Tim's assistance, insistence early on, we emphasized that creating the vision was most important. So we created a vision, that was the first step, and everybody aligned behind the division because the vision is what's driving us. And this time, I think everybody feels the time is right. We demonstrated we can work together. We've shared equipment and supplies together. And so we're dedicated to seeing what we can now do more so together. So I think a lot of the nascent historical stuff that was involved in concerns is no longer there. We're committed to achieving the vision. And Dean Elias. Uh, thank you. I would add to that that this is a, just a unique time and it's a unique vision. We have a chance 
to combine the strength and power of Brown University and the School of Medicine and the School of Public Health and the two largest healthcare delivery systems in the state of Rhode Island to be something truly special, something that can really be transformational for healthcare, transformational for education, and something that can be truly transformational for the economy of the region. All right, let's start to pull some of this apart for people. And I, I want to bring to you folks some of the things we're hearing from viewers since we started reporting on this. And I'm going to put this first one to you, Dr. Babineau. Uh, look, this would be a very powerful organization. I think all of you would agree with that it would have the majority of patients in Rhode Island. Uh, it would have huge sway over health care as well as the economy. And we do hear from viewers who fear they already see their health insurance costs are high. This would be such a powerful organization that, you know, costs from here would just go through the roof. There wouldn't even be much competition. It's a real concern we hear out there. What do you say to those concerns that, that the average Rhode Islander might have about this? Yeah, Ted, thanks. Um, Jim and I hear those concerns. We do. We hear them. I'd say a couple things. I'd say the notion that the market is Rhode Island, I think, is a complete misconception. The market really starts in Boston and goes south all the way to New Haven. It starts in Cape Cod to the east and goes to eastern Connecticut at the west. And when you look at the market through that lens, and quite frankly, that is the market. We're a very small piece of that market, very small, number one. Number two, as you know, Ted, we have something called the Office of the Health Insurance Commissioner in the state. The state of Rhode Island is the only state in the union that has such an office that caps commercial rate increases year over year to no more than 3%. If you look at the last seven or eight years, none of us have been able to drive our prices there's no reason coming together we'll be, we'll, we'll be able to drive up prices. And Medicare and Medicaid, they're not raising their rates. So I understand, I hear the concern, but I don't think it's a, it's a valid one. Dr. Finale, also on the, um, the bigness uh, question, uh, you're going to have to get approval from the antitrust regulators in Washington to do this. And one idea I've heard pop up is that maybe part of how you could get it through is not to keep every hospital currently in the two systems and maybe Kent Hospital would be looked at as something that a different system would want. Is that something you're gonna look at? Absolutely not. So let me just take one, add a little bit to what Dr. Babineau said on the cost equation. OVIC's there. The other thing, we're gonna, we have pledged to be involved in population health and expanding that focus, which we have proven that we can manage costs, improve quality. That's what we're all about. So I think we can we handle the question about cost. And OVIC is a big, big reason. There's been publications in health affairs that say, that has worked to limit cost increases. Listen, we've talked long and hard about bringing these systems together are important. We're, all these hospitals are involved in teaching residents and medical students. All of these hospitals are important to the system. We have no intention of closing Kent. I, I'd ha hazard to say we've decided to keep everything together. We're not interested in splitting anything off. So for your, for your viewers, everybody else, we have no intention of doing that. And we're keeping everything together because it's vital if we're going to be able to take care of the public health of this state. And we're going to be responsible for the health of the state in a lot of terms, like we were this time around with the pandemic. There's no plan to do any of that. And Kent's exceedingly important. The family medicine residencies are located at Kent. So, and at the end of the day, I don't think the Department of Health would be interested in either splitting off Kent or closing it. And Ted, if I might just add to that, I agree 100% with what Dr. Finale said. If the pandemic taught us one thing, is we need to make sure we have surge capacity in the system. The Rhode Island Hospital is filled. The Miriam Hospital is filled. We need Kent. We need the capacity Kent brings to this organization. President Paxson, I want to talk about something that got a lot of, uh, that resonated with people. You talked about the day this was rolled out, and that was the idea of Rhode Island getting an NCI cancer center mm -hmm. back, which Rhode Island hasn't had since 1994. Um, and I think you know, people are intrigued by that. Certainly so many families have dealt with cancer care, had to go sometimes to Boston or somewhere else, uh, depending on the type of cancer. What would concretely that designation mean for Rhode Islanders, apart from obviously the prestige that would come to it for Brown in the hospitals? What, why does that excite you? And what do you think it would mean for the average person? Well, I mean, I'm excited about it. And it's really, you know, the prestige is secondary. The, the main factors, and, and there are a couple, one is, with an NCI designated cancer center, we would be doing and attracting the doctors and the researchers who are doing cutting edge work on cancer. And not only are they doing the research, they're taking that information and they're using it to make sure that people who live in this state and live around in this region are getting the very best care without having to travel up to Boston or down to New Haven. 
you know, I've had family members who've had cancer. I've, I've been in a position of having to travel long distance. It's awful. And people who live in this area deserve to have the best quality of cancer care that they can right here. Dean Elias, broadening that out further, I mean, one of the things people hope for if this happens is that it would lead to a strengthening of the Brown Medical School and especially the research aspect. We know what that's done for Boston. Mm -hmm. um, you, you see other parts of the country where that health system kind of anchors that research and, and it spins off companies and all the rest. How would this, if it were to go through, allow you to do more at the medical school of, of, of that kind of research that gets people excited? Uh, there are a number of things that will stem from this that I think are tremendously, tremendously exciting. First off, you need to understand that right now we have three different research programs uh, in this system. We have a research program in life sciences at Brown. We have a research program in life sciences at uh, here in New England and a research program at uh, <clears throat> Lifespan. We're gonna be able to integrate these three, three programs. We're gonna be able to strategically plan together. We're so those are all separate right now, Dean? They're all separate. We are worse than Noah's Ark. We have not two of everything. We have three of everything. And we need to bring this together so we can strategically plan with each other. And we can get to a place where, as, as President Paxson said, we have people doing cutting edge basic research, taking that information, turning it into treatments, turning it into therapies, and then those protocol-driven uh, therapies are then available for, for the residents of Rhode Island at the new uh, academic medical center. And there is no question that we can have as vibrant a life sciences community in Rhode Island as you have in Boston. My dream is that future future deans are going to look out the window that I'm looking out right now down here in the jewelry district and they're going to see a place filled with biotech startups that will generate jobs uh, and generate great therapies for, for patients. I thought I knew just about everything about this talk but I actually did not realize that was split to be raised right now that's interesting. Uh, Dr. Babin I'm going to give you uh, the nuts and bolts question people have. You mentioned to me when I talked to all of you on the day this was all announced you hope this might get done this calendar year um, and so I'm wondering, A, now that we're into March, if you still feel that's viable, and B, how close you all are to putting in the paperwork uh, with the various regulators. Yeah, great. Thanks, Ted. I do think it's viable, and I think it's possible. We're going to be extremely respectful of the three regulatory agencies that need to uh, opine on this. The Attorney General for the state of Rhode Island, the Department of Health in the state of Rhode Island, and the FTC. And, and we're working on those filings as we speak. We hope to have all of those filings submitted by the end of March. Once we do that, it's up to the regulators to see, have we answered all your questions? Are there other questions we can answer? But we are 100% committed to be completely open and transparent. Uh, to, to catch a phrase from somebody else, this is not about playing hide the ball. We're gonna give any and all information the agencies want. This is very, very important. They have a very important role to play. We respect that role. I want to work with them collaboratively. We've always, already had some very productive conversations with all three of those agencies in advance of the filings, just to make sure we're on the same page. I think if, if the agencies move efficiently uh, and thoroughly, I think we can still get this done in this calendar year, Ted. Dr. Finale, a uh, question for you. So we've, you know, part of what's driven a lot of the different merger discussions this past decade has been some financial challenges that you inherited when you took over Care New England um, including, of course, Memorial Hospital, uh, if this weren't to get approved, you know, none of you will want to talk about that, but it is a, a possibility. Could Care New England continue to operate independently going forward, or do you think you just have to look for a different merger partner as you have before? So first, this is going to get approved. Uh, I'm, all, I'm, the, I'm the half full guy all the time, right? Um, but in all seriousness, that's how vitally important this is. I think you're going to see more than 100% activity in each one of us individually to tell our story and explain why this is the best thing for the state of Rhode Island. Uh, you know, um, with the pandemic, it proved to us without the support money provided by the federal government and the state government, we'd be in, in pretty rough shape right now. That's helped us ride through things. We'll do fine this year. We can't stay alone. We've got to do something with somebody. And so uh, to us, this is the most viable option. It's the best option for the state of Rhode Island. It's the best option for the citizens of Rhode Island. And I, if we could say, what you're asking me is the question I ask. If not this, what? 
Okay, so going off and doing something that uh, strengthens us and doesn't strengthen the whole state doesn't make sense. This is the right thing to do at this time. When we come back, more of our interview in this hospital merger plan, including what this deal might mean for hospital workers. Stay with us. You're watching Newsmakers. Welcome back to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White. We continue with Ted Nisi's interview with the leaders at Brown University Lifespan and Care New England on a proposed hospital merger that could reshape health care in the state forever. President Paxson, you, uh, one thing that made a splash with the announcement was uh, Brown's checkbook. <laughs> and you said Brown is going to commit $125 million at least to this over the next five years. I'm curious where you see that money actually going you know if you have an idea of how you want that targeted or if, if that's down the line but people are curious you know how you see that being invested and why that was important to brown well th thanks ted and i i think it's really important that brown stand up and say this is so important to the state that we're willing to make a major significant investment in the new academic health system uh, where is the money going to go the whole point of this is that how we how we invest these resources is gonna come out of joint strategic planning where Brown sits down with Tim and Jim and others involved in this new health system and we say, what's, what's best for the system? What's best for the state? So if that means a major investment in cancer care, that, that's where it could go. If it means a major investment in reducing health disparities and increasing health equity, that's where it would go. So I don't have any preconceived notions. What I'm excited about is channeling investment in ways that supports research, education, and the care of patients in this state, and doing that in a very integrated, uh, collaborative way. Uh, and sticking with the Brown uh, topic, Dean Elias, I was talking to somebody who's watched all of these merger efforts and discussions over the decades who said, you can't underestimate how important it was that Brown brought the doctors together in recent years with Brown physicians, whereas before, uh, I know there's multiple physicians groups, but but starting to get the doctors kind of under an umbrella um, that helps set that. How is that important to this whole, all the puzzle pieces of bringing the system together? Uh, eventually, at the end of the day, the people who are going to be caring for the patients are the doctors. The, the health systems are buildings, they're facilities, but you need the integration and the coordination of the doctors to really pull off a world-class integrated academic health system. Uh, when I first got here, we had so many different little organizations, foundations, uh, and other structures that you sat down and said, we're going in 19 different directions at once. We finally got a large number of them to sit down and say, we need to come together. We need to have integrated care. We need to have health access. And by them coming together and being successful, it set the stage for everybody watching them to be able to say, we can work together. We can get this done. And we're better when we come together as uh, Dr. Babineau has said. And that's why the first group to come together as independent folks that came together really set the table for all the others. And now everybody believes that coming together is the right thing to do. Uh, Dr. Babineau and Dr. Finale, I want both of you to weigh in on this because I know it's another thing that's gonna be top of mind for a lot of folks watching uh, when they're watching this Sunday morning, and that's jobs. Um, this, you're already two of the biggest and I believe third biggest private employers in the state or overall employers. This will be by far the biggest private employer in the state. And look, I have to imagine there's going to be some overlap here, whether it's in HR or accounting or anything, and that you would want to not have a lot of administrative waste. I mean, you know, Dr. Babin, I'll start with you on this. It, are there going to need to be some jobs that are reduced, even if you hope over the long term, you'll wind up with more jobs? Yeah, I think great question, Ted. And I know it's the top of mind for everyone. It's at the top of the minds of me and Jeff. Here's, how, here's what I would say. You know, there's no question that there will likely be some efficiencies that we're going to need to find, right? They'll likely be administrative. Can't imagine they would be at the bedside. Remember, we have a thousand job vacancies at Lifespan right now. We need more people, not less people. But you're right. None of us are naive. 
We know that there may be some administrative duplication. We have not yet even begun those conversations, but we suspect we will shortly. Net, 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 Ted, this is a job growth story. This is not a job reduction story. You and others are familiar with what has happened in the rest of the country, Boston, Pittsburgh, Chicago, where the academic health care system is the economic anchor for the capital city and the state, resulting in year-over-year -year job growth in the life sciences, in the trades, in the construction. So net, 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 this is a job growth story. And, Dr. Uh, and to add, Ted, uh, I think uh, Tim's right. We have to look at the long term, what we're trying to create here, which is an integrated academic health system that delivers better quality care. And we believe, no question about it, it will be higher quality care, which I could certainly address later. But that really is an economic engine for the region. It's happened everywhere else, as Tim has just said. Uh, short term, there may be some administrative uh, efficiencies we need, to, we need to get to so we can deliver on all the other promises. Long term, there's no question that we're all convinced this will be a job creator working closely with the unions to make sure we all understand it. They understand a lot of this, but we're going to work closely with them to make sure that we can come out with the best best outcome that, that that's possible. Believe it or not, we only have a couple minutes left. So I, I want to ask all of you a pandemic related question as we finish up. And I'll, I'll stick first with the two hospital executives. And that's, I just want to ask you about the current trends on the pandemic. Certainly for the, the lay person like myself, as you watch it, the infections are down, hospitalizations are down, we see people getting vaccinated, there's a lot of hope and optimism. I'm curious how it looks from where you sit when you talk to the, the physicians about what they're seeing, um, Dr. Babineau and then Dr. Finale. Yeah, Ted, I'm gonna steal a quote from Dr. Ja, who spoke to us yesterday. If you use the baseball game metaphor and you know things get back to normal when the game ends and we don't go into extra innings, I think we're in the top of the eighth inning top of the eighth. April will be the bottom of the eighth. May will be the top of the ninth. June will be the bottom of the ninth. And then by summer, I think we're in pretty good shape. So I think right now we're looking good. But here's what I would also say. There is no question that once we get through this pandemic, at some point in the future, there will be another one. I don't know if it's going to be two years from now, 20 years from now, but there will be another one. And we need a resilient healthcare system in the state of Rhode Island to be ready for the next one when it comes. And Dr. Finale, how's it looking at Care New England with the yeah, I agree with uh, Tim that cases are down, but um, we're really looking at you know what's the impact of things going forward. And not only is Tim right about being ready for the future, if this is a, a virus that's going to be around forever, it's going to be around for a while, which we think it will be, if it recur if there's a new variant or it's a bad flu season, it's going to tax the system a bit. We are much better prepared now since we worked together for that next outbreak. And and the public health system in the, in, in the country can't handle this. There's no really straightforward public health system. We create that solution for the state of Iran and making sure that we're resilient and be able to take care of the next, the, the next thing that happens. It could be a hurricane, but we know we can work together to be able to restore and complete the, keep the state healthy. President Paxton, you had kind of a Paul Revere moment early in the pandemic where you had a much discussed New York Times op-ed about if many of the medium-sized colleges in the country weren't to have reopened last fall, you worried many would go out of business now, and many have and, and are doing okay. But I'm curious, when you look ahead to the fall semester of this year, are you planning for a somewhat normal semester? Do you think you're going to have a lot of protocols in place? What are those conversations like right now? So, so good question. And, and yes, you know, one thing I'm really proud of is that all of the college, all of the higher education institutions in Rhode Island have stayed open. And, you know, it's been tough, but, but we're all getting through it and we're all educating students and doing what we want to do. So it's, it's, it's really great. Uh, it's, and as far as the fall goes, we are planning for something very close to normal. We're planning for a traditional semester, in-person teaching. Uh, students will no longer have single rooms. But at the same time, we've learned a lot. And if you know, we do go into extra innings uh, to follow uh, Dr. Babineau's analogy. And if there is a resurgence of variants or something like that, I, I feel pretty confident that we know how to handle it. Might be more parties, too, but you're not allowed to say you condone I that. Can't uh, say uh, that. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and Dean Elias, uh, from the medical education perspective, uh, Tim White and I were talking before we taped today. Will the pandemic experience in any way change how you train future doctors, what you talk about with them, what you emphasize as you think about training the, the next generation after this experience? Uh, I think the pandemic has done quite a bit to basically show the medical students what being a physician is all about. 
Uh, it is put on the table the need to focus on society. It's put on the table the need to focus uh, on your community. And it's in the form of this merger that's, that's uh, being proposed. It's put on the table the need for integrated care from cradle to, to grave. And, and the students have all watched that. They watched the process. They watched how the pandemic was dealt with. They volunteered where they can. They could. Many of them actually graduated early to come in and get on the front lines uh, of the of the uh, care that was being provided. And they watched the right things and they learned the right things during the process. And I'm I'm very proud of them in terms of how they how they worked their way through this. Uh, and I'm very excited because they're going to take those messages with them and use them and integrate them in their practices uh, for the rest of their careers. My thanks to Ted Nisi for that interview. If you missed any of it, it's on WPRI.com. And don't forget to sign up for the Newsmakers podcast through iTunes or any other apps. I'm Tim White. We'll see you next week on Newsmakers.